Hello, I am Jean-Marc Jancovici, a Paris-based consultant uh, working with large corporations and governments on energy and climate change issues. When people mention circular economy, one question that arises is obviously, does it have to go with a special energy system that we could call circular energy? To address this issue, the first thing to do, of course, is to define what is energy apart from something which is mentioned on a bill, gas bill or electricity bill. For that, we have to go back to physics, because in physics, energy has a very precise definition. It is what characterizes something changing in the world surrounding us. Whenever the world before and the world after are different, you know that there has been some kind of energy involved. We can witness that in our daily life, uh, like, for example, when you have a change of temperature somewhere, you have energy involved. When you have a change of movement or speed, you have energy involved. When you have a change of shape, what happens in every industry, you have energy involved. When you have a change of chemical composition, which is also something happening very often in the industry, you have energy involved. When you have electricity interacting with the magnetic field, you have en energy involved. When you have a change of atomic composition, uh, which is why the sun is hitting us, you have energy involved. And of course, the energy that we are most interested in every summer is creating or absorbing radiation, uh, which is also involving energy. These are a number of examples, I could have found some others, that show that whenever you have something changing in the world surrounding us, you have energy involved. Therefore, counting energy or counting the change of the world is about the same thing. From there, something very interesting to do is to compare what uh, the output, uh, sorry, is to compare the output that a man can yield with the extra corporal energy that we now use in our industrial system. If, say, somebody climbs a very high mountain, uh, go to France for that, and you climb on the Mont Blanc, uh, well, the amount of mechanical energy that a pair of legs will yield in a day will be around half a kilowatt hour with uh, something that will represent a huge effort for the uh, human body. So if instead of using machines in the industrial system, we used pair of legs, well, a pair of legs could yield at least, at most, sorry, uh, half a kilowatt hour per day. And if you pay that worker at the minimum wage level, then you will have to pay that kilowatt hour several hundred dollars. If you use arms instead of legs, Say, for example, you give a shovel to someone and you have him uh, shoveling earth for a full day, then the amount of energy that you will get from that pair of arms, and it's rather big arms, uh, is one order of magnitude below what you will get with legs. And you will pay your kilowatt hour with occidental wages several thousand dollars or euros or pounds or whatever it takes. When you compare that with the price of the mechanical output from a machine, then you realize that even with the most expensive energy that we have at hand, say gasoline, well, uh, one liter of gasoline contains 10 kilowatt hour of thermal energy, that is several kilowatt hour of mechanical energy, that you will pay a thousand times to 10,000 times less than what you pay for a human worker. In other words, when we have replaced human workers by machines, we have gained the fact that we can change the world for 1,000 to 10,000 times less in terms of monetary uh, input. This explains all that has happened to us during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it explains why we have replaced people by machine wherever possible. It explains why we have replaced differences in wages by transportation wherever possible, that is globalization. It explains the tremendous increase in human productivity meaning the, the, the amount of physical flows that you can manage in an hour's work. So this basically explains all that we have witnessed uh, during the last two centuries. Of course, the question again is, do we need this uh, to go to circular economy or uh, don't we need this because we are going to have a problem with the energy we use today, which is basically issued from, uh, from non-renewable stocks. Here is the amount of energy which is used per year and per capita in a number of countries in the world. It's expressed in kilowatt hours, so per year and per capita. You see that in uh, what is called developed countries, uh, say countries on the left, uh, the order of magnitude is several tens to 100,000 
uh, kilowatt hours per person and per year. But even in emerging countries, uh, we are already uh, to significant amounts because if you remember that one human body can yield something like 100 kilowatt hours per year of mechanical output, consuming 20,000 kilowatt hours per year or having 100 servants or slaves at your service is something which is equivalent in terms of physical flows uh, that are created. In other words, in Occidental countries today, anybody has the same services uh, that if he or she had, let's say, several hundred sl uh, slaves or servants at his service, which are, of course, uh, tremendous figures. But even in, the, in emerging countries, uh, the average energy consumption per capita puts people at the same level that if they had, let's say, 50 to 100 servants per person. When you realize the place of energy into uh, our economic system, you realize that the, conven the conventional way to look uh, at uh, the, 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 the economic output is actually something which is now uh, not enabling us uh, to make accurate predictions. The standard way to look at the economic system is the one uh, that you're just seeing right now. Uh, the two production factors are capital and work. So if you have plenty of work and plenty of capital, you should get plenty of production. If the production is not rising fast enough uh, in order to reimburse the debt or pay whatever, uh, <laughs> whatever welfare, uh, then you should have more capital. So banks should lend more money or you should have more work. So you should lower the wages and then the system uh, will go on working again. Actually, this is correct in a world uh, where you have no other bottleneck. Uh, but we today live in a world where this is not true because the real flows uh, that feed in our economic system are those. The production comes from work and natural resources and the capital formation is an internal loop to the system. Uh, basically, any production uh, needs resources and work uh, and capital is just past resources and work. The building I'm in right now is past resources and work. The camera, which is filming me right now, is past resources and work. The computer on which this slideshow has been created is past resources and work. And the chair on which I'm sitting, all these are capital elements, is past resources and work. So basically, what we need to have some production, some economic production, is uh, resources and work. The reason why we did not take resources into account in the first place was that depleting stocks two centuries ago was non-significant. Uh, in other words, when the classical economy was set up two centuries ago, uh, it was not worth taking the pain of discounting the stock, the natural stock that we were using. Uh, the first mines did not count uh, compared to the full initial stock of ores. And the first fish uh, that, uh, that we fished in the sea uh, did not count compared to the global fish stocks, etc. So we did not take resources into account and all resources are free in our economic system. Uh, regarding energy, by the way, uh, there is a current assumption uh, that says that wind and the sun are free, but oil and gas are free as well. Nobody paid a single cent for the creation of oil or gas. All it takes for oil and gas is the pain to collect them uh, from under the ground where they remain. So basically our production is taking resources that are free and work that we have to pay to get some, some, some economic output. And in the work uh, that creates the economic output, actually our muscles count for one and extra corporal energy counts for 200, as we have seen on the previous graph. Now, when we look at this way uh, the, the, the economic system uh, is organized, then we realize that we can have a bottleneck on production even though we don't have a bottleneck on capital or on work. If we have a bottleneck on energy in terms of volumes, not in terms of price, then we can have a bottleneck on production. And it's probably what has been happen happening sorry, uh, by little steps uh, since 1975, uh, which, has, which corresponds to a turn uh, in the rate of growth of the energy supply per capita in the world. So a bottleneck on energy means a bottleneck on production, even though we have plenty of capital and even though we have plenty of work. And if we have an additional bottleneck on resources, then we will also get an additional bottleneck on production. Take fishing, for example. 
Suppose you have plenty of boats and plenty of people on the boats. If you don't have any diesel oil to put into the boat, you won't fish anything. And if you don't have any fish in the sea, you won't fish anything either. So you can have plenty of capital, plenty of work, which is happening right now, and not enough production. Plenty of work, we have it. We have unemployment everywhere. Plenty of capital, we have it. We have speculative bubbles everywhere, even though we don't have enough production uh, to fulfill electoral promises or <laughs> debt reimbursement. So what we are witnessing right now is that the bottlenecks are where we are not looking at. And of course, one of the, one of the solutions to this would be to create loops uh, so that we put into the system things that get out of the system today, which is, of course, the idea of circular economy. So can we feed in back uh, re uh, production into uh, resources, so to say, uh, so that the system loops and we are not having or witnessing or experiencing whatever uh, any limits. It's not that simple, actually, because if we take only the resource point of view, here is how it works. We have initial resources plus energy and work, but our work is energy, we get the production. Then plus energy, again, we can recycle and refeed production. But as everybody knows, there is a law in physics uh, that says that you cannot create nor destroy energy in a closed system. So basically, in this kind of system, you can recycle materials and put materials into a loop. The only thing you can put into a loop is energy. Energy has to add up. And so the main challenge of circular economy will be actually uh, to have the system functioning with some kind of linear energy that still has to remain.